Welcome to Faith in Recovery with Anthony Uncompura. Welcome to Banyan's Faith in Recovery program. I'm your host, Anthony Akimpora. The Faith in Recovery radio show focuses on advice and insight for families of those in addiction and suffering with mental health issues, powerful personal testimonies, and we have guests who are experts in their field. And we have some really good ones today that are experts in their field, that's for sure. Uh, I am also the director and chaplain at Banyan uh, Treatment Center's Faith and Recovery program. Faith and Recovery is a substance abuse and alcohol treatment center. It's a non-denominational program. The program is designed to allow clients to establish or restore their faith and relationship with God while also addressing their addiction. All that is required for this program is that someone is seeking to establish or restore a relationship with God. Uh, we meet clients right where they're at on their spiritual journey, or they may not even have a spiritual journey at all, and that's fine. So uh, we love the program. We've had it for two and a half years. Very blessed to be able to, to be involved with this. It's just amazing to watch the change and the transformation from the inside out of people who come into this program. So at this time, I want to introduce our our guests. We have some really incredible guests here today in studio. Uh, this is a, a very abbreviated version of their bios. Yeah, I, it's amazing some of the stuff that they've been involved with. I think uh, the only thing they haven't been involved with is the moon landing, possibly. I mean, there's they have some really, really incredible backgrounds and, uh, and history. We have Howard Rosen, who has served as assistant state attorney for over 30 years. He is the deputy chief of special prosecutions and a member of the Miami-Dade Opiate Task Force. He's also the division chief of the narcotics unit. And we also have Christine Zoralden. She has been a Miami-Dade prosecutor for nearly 20 years. She has served under Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle. She is an assistant chief state attorney of the legal division for special prosecutions. And she's also a dynamic speaker and women's ministry leader at Christ Journey Church. So we're very blessed and very happy to have them. Welcome both of you, Christine and Howard, to the show. Anthony, thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you for having us, Anthony, and thank you for those gracious introductions. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, well, I, I've been doing some research. You know, I always like to do that before we have guests on, and I tell you, it's like one thing after another. I've been hearing so many incredibly powerful things and positive things about you. You know, I, I keep hearing the, the word pit bull keeps coming up, and it has to do with Christine in the uh, courtroom, like a pit bull. And, uh, and, and I have a pit bull, and he's like the sweetest dog ever, so I don't know. But I think they're talking about she's pretty tenacious. I think that's the pit bull. That, that's what I gather from the people that I've spoken to in the research. So this is just this is just great to have you. We're really excited about this. I'm going to start with Howard. Um, Howard, we're, we're talking a little bit about the opiate epidemic. We're going to get into that and those types of things. Um, where, how did we get to the, the point that where we're at right now with this epidemic? Okay, we need to start out with the notion that opioids are the most addictive substance ever known to mankind. Ever known to mankind. Wow. And, and it's 80% of the people that are on the streets injecting um, heroin, started out with a legitimate prescription from a physician. Um, opiates includes drugs such as Oxycontin, Percocet, Hydrocodone, uh, Oxycodone, and typically what happens is people get sports injuries when they're in an automobile accident, and physicians are quick to give them Oxycodone or any of these other um, opiates because to manage pain, they work. Right. They do work. That's what they're intended to do, and they do work. However, um, nobody really envisioned how ad addictive these substances truly, truly are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, we live in a society now where there really is a, a quick fix for everything in the form of a pill. Sure. If I went to the doctor today and I said to him, listen, doc, my back is hurting me, he might say to me, well, Howard, you need to lose about 10 pounds. You've put on some weight since the holidays. That might work. Right. He could say to me, I want you to um, start exercising, start running again. That might work. He might say to me, I want you to start doing yoga and strengthening your core. That might work. Or he could write me a prescription. That will work. 
that will alleviate my pain. But unfortunately, um, there's a significant likelihood that would also lead to addiction. In 2016, 99% um, of the people in the United States that had surgical procedures performed upon them went home with a um, opioid prescription, 99%. Right. And three months post-operative, um, three million of these people were still using opioids. Wow, wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, I actually did have a back injury recently and I did go to the doctor and he told me I had to lose about 80 pounds. And so, so, you know, it is, you know, if you, if you put those in perspective and you have those two comparisons, a pill or, you know, going into the gym and eating differently and all this stuff, it's a lot easier to just pop that pill. But, you know, the, the, I think the biggest difference is from what we see with our clients at, at Banyan Treatment Center, you know, in Pompano Beach, we, we see clients coming in that you would never think or they were never involved with any illegal activity. It starts off with a legitimate reason. Like, like Howard just mentioned, or you have a sports injury, or you get injured on the job, and the next thing you know, you're taking these pills, and now you're addicted. And, and we see that escalate from something that a doctor's prescribing to the next thing you know, they're doing heroin, right? right? So, I mean, it's just, it's so different than, like, what we were talking about earlier, Howard, like, years ago, maybe 30, 40, whatever it is, years ago. It's just a totally different landscape now with, with what's out there, and, and not only what's out there, but how dangerous it is. I mean, it's like Russian roulette by doing any of this stuff. It's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous because what's happening now is, is heroin is being cut with deadly substances. Yes. It's being cut with fentanyl and carfentanyl. Fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. Yes. And people are buying heroin and it's cut with fentanyl and they don't know it. Um, it's purchased on the dark web mm -hmm. and it is much cheaper than heroin. So it's actually used as a cutting agent yeah. and, and it's killing people. And then the next thing is carfentanil, yes. which is 100 times stronger than fentanyl or 10,000 times stronger than morphine. The only people that, that really use carfentanil are people at the zoo because carfentanil, <laughs> exactly. carfentanil is an elephant tranquilizer yeah. and a large primate tranquilizer. Amazing, amazing. I want to just comment on that, and then I want to get Christine in, uh, in here. But I had the police chief of uh, Orlando, uh, John Mina, on a couple weeks ago and we were talking about this and I've experienced it from different clients and being in this industry that I'm in the recovery industry and I cannot believe this but this is really what happens someone overdoses and there's fentanyl in it there's car fentanyl in it and that dealers sales go through the roof and people are actually seeking that person out because they think they're gonna get that huge high and I mean, I, you would think they would run the opposite way and go no, nowhere near them. But one, that's an incentive for drug dealers to have people overdosing because they know that they don't care. Their sales are going to go through the roof. And he actually said, uh, Chief Mina, when he was on, he said they had undercover guys doing operations. And they had it on video and things. And, and they were saying, yeah, this is the stuff that's killing people. This is, this is it. So, I mean, when you have that type of mentality going on, it's just, it's, it's really scary out there. And then, you know, you have the families that are in the middle of all this. We're going to touch on that. But it's, it's amazing. But I want to bring Christine in. Christine, um, as a prosecutor, okay, because not everybody understands really what that role is and, and, and what it entails. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is as a prosecutor and what you do, you know, on a, on, a, on a pretty regular basis. I know you get involved with some very special prosecutions. Uh, Anthony, as prosecutors, we represent the people of the state of Florida. We are sworn to uphold the laws of the state of Florida. And therefore, when folks are accused of violating those laws, which can range from committing a battery or a theft or a burglary to drug trafficking to capital homicides, it's our obligation and our duty to prove that case in a court before a judge and before a jury. Absolutely. And that's what we do. There are over 350 prosecutors in the Miami-Dade County State Attorney's Office, and the cases that they handle, as I said, range from the smaller cases all the way up to capital homicides. Wow, that's amazing that there's that many people on staff. And, and we're here not only to educate, right, to mm -hmm. educate your listeners, to educate yes. the public, but also to um, encourage people that we cannot continue to have the stigma that we have to embrace, we have to encourage, we have to assist people who are struggling with addiction, no matter what it is, and bring them to the resources 
that can help them find freedom. Wow, absolutely. Well said. The stigma, it, it kind of makes you think with mental health and mental illness, mm -hmm. you know, the stigma that's related to that. And, you know, it makes it so much more difficult for people to seek help if you have that big stigma and, and everybody, no one wants every, anything to do with you and you're shunned by society. Well, why would you even tell anyone that you have a problem? So, you, you know, and it, so it's, it's in the dark and that makes it that much worse. So, so absolutely, I totally agree with that, with the, the, the stigma and just, you know, what people, people think when they hear, you know, addict or they hear that, you know, that type of word is a, it's kind of like a loaded word almost and people have a reaction to that. And, um, you know, we have to make it easier for people to seek out help is so really what it comes down what to. What we've done in the criminal justice system, um, under the direction of our boss, Captain Fernandez Rendell, our elected state attorney, we have shifted the focus from um, incarceration to treatment for, for users. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a specialized drug court that was actually the first one set up um, in the United States several decades ago. Wow. Um, and now it's replicated throughout the country. And we have a specialized track of treatment for opioid users with medication-assisted treatment. And it's, it's a fantastic program. Um, the last time that I checked a few weeks ago, we had about 341 participants in that program. Right. And by allowing us to treat um, users as, as patients, if you will, rather than as criminal defendants, and get them the treatment that they need, that allows us to focus our law enforcement resources upon those dealers that you were talking about with the chief mm -hmm. um, and those dealers that we go we go after in the narcotics unit at the state attorney's office and allow us to you know intensify our prosecutions upon those people the people who are distributing this poison right. throughout our community absolutely i think there has to be a balance you know we were talking about this with the chief and it was you know sometimes you'll have chiefs or or sheriffs and it's just Lock them up, lock them up. We got to lock everybody up, and, and that's the focus. And then you'll have the other extreme. It might be, oh, community, you know, community. We have to get in with these people. We have to establish rapports and stuff. And I think it has to be a balance because there's going to be some people you, you they need to get locked up. This yeah. is not this is not an epidemic that we can handcuff our way out of. Right. It is absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the people who are distributing this this poison, yes, they need to be locked up. Mm -hmm. But the people that are just in possession that are using it. They need help. Right. They need help, and and that's that's the word that we have to get out is you know, it's a stigma um, that needs to be overcome. You know, the difference between the opioid epidemic and any other epidemic is people never really took these drugs to get high. People took these drugs right. just to be, just to exist, yeah. just to get through their day. Big difference. Big yeah, difference. Absolutely. That's a great point. Well said. And if I can just follow yeah. up, and 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 there is no quick fix either. It's a process. Recovery from addiction is a process, mm -hmm. and that's why we have to build communities around these people that can give them the support that they need. Right, absolutely. That's, you know, with our program, we connect them with the church, Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale. We connect them with Celebrate Recovery. Mm -hmm. They have a built-in support system, and that's why it's effective, and our relapse rate is very low. We don't just, you know, treat them, okay, you're done, get out, and that's it. Because as soon as they walk, they can have every intention of doing the right thing while they're in treatment. As soon as they walk out there and they go right back to those same people that they were hanging out with, those same places where they were hanging out with, it is extremely difficult. You just get drawn right back to it. Sure. And um, we try to stress that a lot, but but we, we see a lot more success with that, that camaraderie, the camaraderie that's, that's built, the fellowship that happens with the church and different ministries. It's very, very, very powerful. And they welcome that because they think they're looking at church or God or anything like that is judgment. I don't want anything to do with that. That's judgment. I don't, I'm going the other way from that. And then when they realize it's not and it's encouraging, it's welcoming them, it's a beautiful thing to see that transition. We're going to have to take a quick break. We'll be back in 30 seconds. My name is Anthony Akinfora, Faith and Recovery Radio Program. one are struggling with drug and alcohol problems or mental health disorders, call Banyan Treatment Center at 888-270-5712. Visit our website, faithandrecovery.com. We have a compassionate and understanding staff that were once in your shoes, and our clinical team is highly skilled to handle all types of addictions. If you need help, 
Don't wait. Call 888-270-5712 or visit our website, faithinrecovery.com. Welcome back to Faith and Recovery. My name is Anthony Akinpora, your host. Talking with some really amazing guests today here in studio. Howard Rosen, State Attorney, Deputy State Attorney, and uh, we have also Christine Sarabin. Uh So, Howard, let's go back to where we, we were talking about earlier on. Where uh, were some of the things, what, what were some of the things that led up to creating uh, the Miami-Dade Opiate Task Force? So the Opioid Addiction Task Force was formed by four entities that really saw a need in our community, as unfortunately there is a need throughout the nation. Um, and so it was formed by our state attorney, Kathy fernandez Rumble, the Miami-Dade County Department of Health, the Department of Children and Family Services, and Mayor Jimenez's office, right. our county mayor. And the four entities got together and put together this task force that really looked at the opioid epidemic from stem to stern, um, causes, solutions, um, from a criminal justice perspective, from a treatment perspective, from every perspective um, that there is. Mm -hmm. and, and we meet regularly. It was originally supposed to sunset after one year. We decided amongst ourselves at, at one of our public meetings to extend it. And so we still have our regular meetings. And we've done a lot of great work. It's led to a lot of legislative changes here in the state of Florida. That's great. But, you know, it's great to hear when people come together I mean, I don't know what side of the aisle people are on or whatever. I'm sure there's a lot of different ones, you know, as far as political views and things. But to, when you have that type of insight from so many different people, you know, and you're able to meet and you're able to really dissect a, a, an issue and a problem that's such a serious one, things get done. That's great that you guys are doing that. It's yeah, it's, a, it's absolutely not a political issue at all. I mean, this is something yeah. that's killing people and, and, you know, the heck with politics with something like this. Yeah. Um, well, the good thing about the task force, the main you know advantage to it is, you know, we on the criminal justice side had a lot of data. People in public health had a lot of data, and this is really an opportunity for everybody to get together and 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 share. Everybody come out of their silos, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 speak to each other on a regular, ongoing basis about this issue to come up with common solutions. Right. And like I said, there have been some fantastic legislative changes, both in the criminal justice arena, both in the um, in the in the treatment arena mm -hmm. and the prescription writing arena right so if you want we could talk about some of those issues absolutely yeah you know you know what it is sometimes even if it's not politics it's just different sectors sometimes and because I, I was dealing with this thing it was called building bridges and it had to do with building bridges between the faith mental health addiction law enforcement communities and the stumbling blocks that I would come across like for faith and mental health for example the, the, the mental health people, a lot of it was, you know, they're psychotic, they need medication, and from the faith perspective, it was a spiritual thing, and they, they just didn't see eye to eye on that, so they kind of went their own ways. It was very fragmented. It's gotten better, I think, but it's so important for different sectors, law enforcement, criminal justice, faith, addiction, mental health, all these different sectors to just come together with this. And that's how it's going gonna, it's gonna to be impacted. And that's the only way for it to work. Exactly. exactly. And just by way of an example, Howard mentioned drug court. And we are seeing success with drug court. Um, I was at a community event in, around Thanksgiving feeding the homeless veterans with the chiefs of police. And one gentleman pulled me aside to say that he went through drug court. Um, and that he found success and freedom through that. Wow. So yeah. he wanted me to extend that message to our boss, Kathy Rundle. Excellent. Um, and, and, and those are the biggest advocates, mm -hmm. too. When, when, when someone overcomes something, That's you right. start to develop a compassion for other people mm -hmm. that are suffering with the similar thing, and you want to help them. And, and you, that voice goes out. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Christine, let me ask you about the, the families, because I'm sure you deal with them a lot of times, you know, whether it be, you know, with the opiate epidemic or whatever the case may be, like, um, they endure a lot of suffering, you know, at the hands of addiction. What, what are some advice maybe that you could tell family members of loved ones that are out there right now in active addiction and they're just waiting by the phone to get that horrible call? And, you know, what do you think is, um, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, encouragement could you offer them from your perspective? 
I have a unique perspective, I think, not only as a prosecutor, but as a women's ministry leader who mm -hmm. sees this quite a bit. Um, I guess the couple of things that I would say to them would be, um, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. It is a process. Yes. Um, and that if they are faithful, and, and I, like you, I, I'm a firm believer in God. I'm a firm believer in faith. You reach out, you get on your knees, and you will see mm -hmm. um, light. Yes. Uh, as long as we continue to support those people that are suffering like that, they will feel that love, um, and, and things will happen. Um, and as Christine yes. said, it's a process, so people are going to slip back. That's mm. right. They're going to slip back. Yeah. You cannot give up hope. You no. cannot give up hope because, you know, somebody relapses. Absolutely. And, and we can't judge either, right? No. We have, no. especially sometimes the church, right? We have this mm. quick um, instinct to judge. You can't judge because right. we've all got something. Um, and this, these people happen to be dealing with this and compassion. Right. That's what right. we've got to extend. Yeah, if, the, if there's one thing that's really going to turn someone off and then run the other way right. from the church is the judgment. <laughs> Because we, we get clients in all the time, and when we tell them about this faith programming, most of the time they run the other way. Mm -hmm. They're like, no way, I don't want to do it. What happens is they notice a difference and a change in the existing clients. They may have known them for years, and they're telling them about this programming and what God is doing them, how he's transforming them from the inside out. And they're like, I knew this guy for years. He was horrible. Now he seems like calmer. He seems like he has peace you know, and he's telling me about this, maybe it'll work for me. So, so when they realize it's not about judgments and condemnation and guilt, we're trying to get them out of that stuff. Right. We're not trying to lay more on top of them because that will definitely make them run the other way. And it was never really supposed to be like that to begin with. Like that kind of very distorted along the way the last uh, few thousand years. But um, Howard, back to you. Let me ask you a little bit about this needle exchange uh, program that you guys have down there. Sure, so the Needle Exchange Program came to be um, about two years ago, and it's a, a wonderful program that was set up as a five-year pilot project um, from the Florida, Leg Florida Legislature. Mm -hmm. And um, it is run through the University of Miami, and public funding cannot be used for it. That was one of the stipulations. So it's all through private funding, and it's a one-to-one -one needle exchange program where they are giving out syringes to folks who are turning in dirty syringes or getting clean syringes. Wow. And one of the things that motivated the program is um, in Miami-Dade County, believe it or not, we were number one a couple of years ago for new HIV infections. Not the highest rate of HIV infections in the nation, but, but the highest rate of new infections in the nation. Wow. And, and, and HIV and hepatitis C are regularly passed through people sharing syringes. Right. So the idea was to give clean syringes when people turn in dirty syringes. And that way it's getting dirty syringes off of the streets so people aren't stepping on them, children aren't picking them up. Mm -hmm. um, and the wonderful thing about this program is it is a point of contact. And as of December 1st, there were about 547 participants. I'm sorry, December 30th of last year, mm -hmm. there were about 547 participants. They have collected over 12,000 more syringes than they've given out. And they have about 81 people, or 15% of their people, have gotten into treatment. Wow. Um, and these are people, many of whom are on the streets, that would have otherwise not had contact to get into treatment before. Sure. That's, that's amazing. And, and it just kind of goes into the whole line of thinking of, of people care. There, there's hope, and, and we're not going to turn our backs on you. I mean, and that is such an important thing. I see some amazing things with, with the clients that we have. Once they get past detox and they start to you know, get engaged in the programming and, and what we're doing and we're trying to apply biblical principles is really what we're doing. Uh, the change is just amazing, but they, they have a good heart. They, somebody's crying, there's three or four people around them praying for them and trying to encourage them. And they're not who they were in active addiction. And it's really important that, it's not, it doesn't mean they, have to, they, they don't have to deal with the consequences of it, but you know, they're, they're not who they were when they were involved with that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna need to close, and I really want to thank uh, both of you for being on. Um, just an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Christina and Howard. Uh, this is very very uh, very very interesting uh, conversation. If you or someone you know is in need of treatment, please take that leap of faith. Go online, faithandrecovery.org.
www.banyantreatmentcenter.com or banyantreatmentcenter.com or give us a call at 888-270-5712. I'm Anthony Akampora. Join us every Saturday uh, at our new time, 1.30 in the Orlando area on The Word and also Sunday at 1.30. And we're also on at 9.30 a.m. on Saturdays on 9.70 a.m. Faith Talk Atlanta. Thank you for joining us. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. God bless you.